All right. Uh, I would like to welcome everybody to class, Philosophy 304. Uh, we're going to cover drug and alcohol today. And I did email the documentary out to everyone. So could everybody see that email? So you can watch it if you want. Um, I only I only usually show about an hour of that in class just because we only have three hours. And by the time lecture is over, there's only time for about an hour of the documentary. If you watch the whole documentary, uh, you can lament with Brie because uh, she is she was upset that she watched the whole thing. It's not a bad documentary. It's a good documentary. It's worth watching the whole thing, but it is an hour and 45 minutes uh, if you watch the whole thing. Uh, so anyway, I did put on the board a few of the things that uh, we are going to be dealing with uh, today is drugs and alcohol. And then the second half of class, we have the documentary. Uh, next Monday, we have on the 22nd, we will be covering freedom of speech. And the documentary for that is called Shouting Fire. I think, I think it's about 45 minutes. And then uh, that's, that's actually our last documentary. And that's your last assignment for the documentary. Uh, it will be due, of course, the response paper will be due on the 29th. Uh, war and, and we'll be covering war and terrorism and you will have your third essay due. So, you know, we have three, three big essays with due dates and the last one is due on the 29th. So we'll cover jokes and alcohol. Our documentary today is called The Union, The Business Behind Getting High. And that response paper will be due before class next Monday. Then we'll watch the Shouting Fire documentary next Monday on the 22nd, and that will be due on the 29th. The response paper will do due on the 29th. Also on the 29th, you'll have the warrant, uh, your, your third essay done. Now remember that once we cover it in class, you cannot you can't do a paper over it. So if you don't want to do your paper on drugs or on the war and terrorism, your only choice is, uh, will be freedom of speech. So that means that if you want to write on something other than war and terrorism, from this point on, next week will be your last chance to write on freedom of speech, or else you'll be stuck with war and terrorism. Now, maybe war and terrorism is not one you feel stuck with, but I'm just saying, if you want a choice, then that's what you'll have to do. What's that, Jalen? Terrorism. Yeah, anything to do with war, terrorism, combat, anything like that. Yeah, that, yeah, it's a really, really wide. It's a really wide, you know, it's it's really wide options for you. Hey, uh, as long as you follow the directions on the grading rubric, yeah. that's all that matters. Um, that is that is one thing that I want to bring up to the class is that this last batch of papers, I had a tremendous number of people that I don't think used the grading rubric. And you either didn't have, you either gave me a sentence statement, like I'm going to write about such and such and such and such, or you didn't include any kind of thesis of any kind, or you didn't include like an ethical framework that you used uh, or uh, the, the number 12 on the grading rubric is where you're supposed to have a section dedicated to one ethicist out of the book that disagrees with you and one that does agree with you and i had a lot of people forgetting to do that as well and um i am going to be i want to be really clear that by your third paper I will have no patience for that whatsoever. I want a clear thesis. I do not want a sentence statement. I don't want to know what you're going to write about. You know, I want to know what you're arguing. And a sentence statement does not tell me what you're arguing. It says you're going to talk about this and this and this. And I, I don't want to hear you talk about things. I want to know what you're going to argue. So, the grading rubric states that if you don't give me a thesis and if you don't give me an ethical framework that you get a zero 
I will promise you, I will, I will honor that on the third paper. If I don't get a thesis, you will get a zero. I don't care if it's an eight page paper that you did tons of research on. Use your grading rubric, give me a thesis, give me an ethical framework that you use to make your argument. If you don't include the section about ethicists, I won't give you a zero, but I'm gonna, I am gonna discount it significantly. So be prepared on this third paper, you should, uh, you should, uh, on all the papers that I graded, if you miss those things, I pointed them out. So by the third paper, I do expect that you will have learned from your mistakes and that you're ready to correct them. But I just want to be clear, on the third essay, your last one, if you don't include a thesis and if you do not include and make an a thesis that makes an argument, that you're arguing a point and you don't you and you don't provide an ethical framework and the thesis specifically says that that stuff needs to be in the first paragraph make sure it's in the first paragraph because if it's not i don't want to go through the whole paper looking for it and thinking oh well here it is or here it is i want it in the first paragraph so i need a thesis i need an ethical framework and put that in that first paragraph or I will give you a zero. And I do not want to give you a zero. I want everybody to get 100%. But, you know, I provided a grading rubric for a reason and I do need you to use it and I want you to use it. And if you will use it, the paper will pretty much write itself. So just learn from the mistakes that you made in the past, if you made any, it's not the end of the world, but you need to learn from it. And this, that last paper is where you know, you show me if you're willing to follow directions or not. And that's really what it comes down to. Any questions about the essays? Okay, now I wanna be specific. I'm talking about the essays, not the documentary response papers. The documentary response papers, you, you did really well and you don't need, an, you don't need an, uh, an, a specific uh, thesis. You're not arguing a point, you're responding to the essay. And that is a time that I do wanna know what your thoughts are on some of those things. So I just wanna make sure you understand, I'm talking about the, the six to eight page essay and not the documentary response papers because I just don't want there to be any confusion on that. Any questions? Okay, all right. Um, so next week is freedom of speech. The 29th is war and terrorism. And then we have Easter break, I believe. Is that, is that what you have for your other classes? Easter break? Okay. Then on the 12th, I'm going to do, uh, I usually do a, a final exam review, but I don't see any reason that we need to all come into class for a 15 to 20 minute final exam review. I don't, they're not usually very long. So I thought what I would do is make, send out a Zoom link if you want to be part of that, which I, I do recommend that you will, I'll probably find some things. Oh, I didn't cover this very well in class. You know, I wanna make sure that I set you up to succeed and do well on the exam since it's only, the final exam has no essay questions. So you'll need to know what's on there because it's all, it's just 50 multiple choice questions and then poof, you're done. So that'll be on the 12th. I'll send out a Zoom link and we'll have a, a Zoom review. And then one week later on Monday, the 19th, uh, we'll come back. Um, I apologize that it's taken so long for the final exam. I don't like that. I, I, I don't like the fact that we have our last class on the 29th and we don't actually take the final exam until the 19th. That seems like really, really long, but that's out of my control. And, and the 19th is, it's actually what the school pro provided as the day that our final exam is supposed to take place. So a lot of final exams will take place on Thursday and Friday, and then, but ours is on that Monday after that. So any questions about our schedule? Okay. All right. Um, so we're gonna cover drugs and alcohol today and the ethical issues that surround that. But before we do that, uh, 
I'm sure we have some people that aren't yet 21 here. Um, so, uh, so anybody that's not 21, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to ask a specific question, but I want, if you're under 21, I want you to answer it as if like hypothetically you were 21. I know that no one under 21 actually drinks alcohol ever, right? You're awfully, obviously, awfully quiet. No, I, I, I am not. <laughs> Your birthday is next Wednesday. You'll be 21 next Wednesday. Okay. So if you're if you're if you're under 21, I know that you're only speaking hypothetically, not not really. Or if you were in another country where where it was legal, right? So we 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 have that understanding. So no one's going to get in trouble here. Uh, but um, does anybody have a favorite drink? And and if you do, how does your body? respond to it like what can you expect if no one goes first i can ali go ahead and go first i'm going to turn you around okay so hypothetically i'm 21 but um <laughs> my favorite is either i like seagram's i like mike's hard lemonade and i like dirty shirley's a lot because shirley temples are one of my favorite things ever a dirty or, dirty shirley is what it's called yeah or strawberry vodka lemonades those are solid i my mom's behind me she's looking at me weird but brie brie likes your 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 taste there. thank you brie nursing majors unite up in here but yeah <laughs> and my body responds i i just get relaxed and i'm just a i laugh a lot i'm I'm like a slap happy girl. It's the same way when I get tired, I get extremely slap happy. My mom knows that very well. Yeah. But yeah. I just get extremely happy and then I just fall asleep. Well, thank you very much, Allie. Uh, Jalen. Tequila. In Mexico. And how does do, how does your body respond to tequila? Good times. <laughs> it what? Good times. What's 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 good times? Can you give us any details? <laughs> Dancing at family ga gatherings. So, so Brie, how about you? You get hyper. What makes you hyper? Um, it also depends on my environment too. So sometimes I like wanted it, I try. But it just depends if like I'm going through something or like if I'm just chilling. If I'm chilling, I'll get really numb. I'm already kind of a hyper and like not one person, but like it's just like so you might get hyper, you might cry. <laughs> but you know that those are two options, right? Mm -hmm. So when you when you so you you kind of have an idea of what might be coming. Okay. Okay. Who else? All right, Webb. Uh, well, when I was younger, we could drink on everyone else's cherry spice rum a lot. Cherry spice rum? Yeah, it's pretty good. Now that I'm uh, you know growing I'm growing I might be one of my favorite uh drink. And Roman Coast, like Roman Coast, I like the old stuff if you want to. Do you have a good place to get Long Island iced teas or do you make them yourself? The pub, the pub makes them for you on uh, downtown. Uh, that's where I usually get hot. Uh, I don't know, Phil. In Pendle, how many? One Long Island, you know, I'm going, all right. And Sue's like getting there. There's three. He's like, that's where I stop. If I have three, that's where I stop. But yeah. Can, can you still function with three? Yeah, 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 yeah. I can still function with three. I probably shouldn't drive with three. I usually do not drive after three, but I can still, I'm coherent. There's a lot of alcohol in Long Island iced teas. Yeah, no, I know. Uh, I take a lot of alcohol. 
The, the, the only reason I know is that when I was in when I was in college, I actually worked at a sports bar and like when when it wasn't busy, like in the afternoon, I would wait tables and I'd have to I'd have to run the bar, too. So people would come in and have drinks. So I actually learned how to do it. And so my boss taught me how to make a long line iced tea. And it was like, go, 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 booze. Go, 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 booze. Go, 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 booze. And then they, then he took the, uh, you know, the hose that does like Coca-Cola and he's like, squirt. <laughs> and that was it. it was, all it did was like color it. So, oh, I yeah. Jalen? Watermelon what? Sir. I, I guess I don't know what that is. Oh, okay. All right. Well, let's hear from. Thank you, Webb. Thank you, Jalen. Uh, Bree, who else wants to share? Anthony? I like, like coffee liqueur and hot chocolate. Oh, peppermint liqueur and hot chocolate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just like, you know, it's like Christmas time. Christmas time. Oh, yeah. That's like what I drink at home. Sure. Sure. Do uh does can can you tell that it has any effect on you? Yeah, look at me. I'm like 135 pounds. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I get a lot of energy and I plateau out and then I just like kind of crash and buy for okay. two hours or whatever. Okay. All right, Brady. What'd you say? True. Oh, okay. Hard seltzer. <laughs> But um, it just kind of like takes away the boundaries. Okay. <laughs> a lot of impulse things. Okay. We'll, we'll get to you, Jasmine. Shelby. More on the fruity side. And what what kind of an effect does it have on you? Clumsy and you lose stuff. Yeah. How, how is it looking for things when you feel that way? <laughs> it's funny. Shoes in the fridge. Oh my goodness, that must have been some really good seltzer. Yeah. All right, Jasmine. Um, I didn't see more food stuff too, like my card or food, like all those kind of things are like hard stuff, and I'll probably go back and one day and like old fashions. Old fashions. Where did you learn about old fashions? Uh my whole time dad right there. Okay. Okay. I, I saw those when I, I, I spent a little bit of a time. I didn't watch all the seasons, but I watched some of Mad Men mm -hmm. and they had old, they drank like crazy on that show. It was insane. They're good. Yep. Yep. I get that reaction a lot, but I like I, I think I think the TV shows that I've watched where they drank the most were the Peaky Blinders and Mad Men. It just and Suits they drank quite a bit in Suits too. So, well, who else? Anybody else want to share? Like if I'm in New Orleans, I always drink Coke because I don't want to be around people that drink. So it, it does make you ready to go to take take a nap or something. Yeah, I just kind of, it's, it's really funny, but I'm very calm. Like when I drink, my parents thought I was going to be like angry or a crier. Um, 
prices are now a lot of it. And just a, I'm just a very like sort out person. Um, where like if I'm anything, I just kind of so very chill. Okay. Allie, are you hearing what people are saying? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you, Peyton. Who else? Anybody else want to go? I think I drink whiskey when it's great. You do the what uh, do you have a particular uh, brand that you like? Not the ones they sell here. Black one. More than long. What is it? Okay. They taste a lot different than like uh, Jose Cuervo, don't they? Even the ones like if you taste like Jose Cuervo here and back there, it tastes different. And where's home? Like um, Samara, Okay. Okay. And I guess how it makes me feel like I'm Mexican, so I just uh, start, I forget English. If I'm here, I forget English, and I just. Really? I'll come talk to you, like have a little conversation in Spanish. Okay. I won't realize that I'm just not speaking English. Okay. okay. I, I did have some. Uh, I did have, I went to the tap room in Quincy and they have specialty uh, Bloody Marys mm -hmm. and they have some that they do with uh, Mexican tequila. Okay. And it's, it has a lot different flavor. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I don't know why it's different. Yeah. I like some of them. Some of them I liked a lot. Some of them tasted like kind of like dirty feet. And I, well, it depends on like, it depends on a lot of different things, I guess. Yeah. 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 If I can go, I'm going to use. Sure. My family drinks a lot of people. Okay. Who else? Anybody else want to share? What 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 happens to you? I just and I have them there as well as the Marilyn. Okay. Yeah, Like you are maybe allergic to it? I don't know, maybe. But yeah. My brother is I always don't like this. You know? My brother's Korean. Uh, we adopted him and when he drinks, his face like expands, puffs up, yeah. and oh, turns turn super super red super red and, and he used to manage uh, like high high class restaurants a lot so they always had bars and so he would he would he would drink and he would just white knuckle the effects and i was like andy you, you need to stop yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so do you do you still try it or do you just yeah, steer it clear? Yeah, because it's like when my friends and stuff are drinking, but I don't know if you know what So probably not very often. No, I don't usually often because I'm not saying that. Yep. Yep. Jalen? I, I just couldn't believe, like I, I saw him drink and he just would turn like feet red and you could tell he was like having a major reaction to it. So, yeah. Anybody else want to share? Yeah, I can drink beer. Beer is the one thing. Um, I would say that my favorite is uh, like probably going to like a really good Mexican restaurant and getting a frozen margarita with uh, salt. I love salt and I don't know why, but my dad got me hooked on um, 
and for, for some people, this is going to seem like sacrilegious, but my dad got me hooked on green olives with, with my, uh, with my margaritas. And so I love, I love green olives period, but I really like them with my frozen margaritas. So those are probably my favorite. Um, I also like to try really good Bloody Marys. Uh, I do, I do like a really good beer, like uh, bass beer or uh, like the brown ales. I like, yeah, I like, I like that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I like a lot of different alcohol. So uh, I also like a drink called a lemon drop. Those are, those are addictive. Those are pretty great. Um, and the effect it has on me is it doesn't take very much alcohol. And, you know, you, you live a lot of your life where you try to be disciplined and make good decisions about like what you eat and, and stuff, but it doesn't take much alcohol. And I think, oh, an entire frozen pizza sounds awesome right now at 11 o'clock at night. And I have, I literally have no resistance. Like there's nothing that says, you know, all those carbs are going to hop you up and make you sleep terrible. And the next day you're going to regret it. Nothing about that happens. It's just like, oh, I think I should put a frozen pizza in. I should pile high extra cheese on it and, uh, and eat the entire thing in like five minutes. And nothing about that seems inappropriate or wrong to me at the time. Oh. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and different people do respond in different ways. I, when I was in junior college, uh, I had a, I worked precast concrete during the summertime and I had a guy, I had a buddy that I worked with. I, I don't know if he was really my friend. He just was a guy that I worked with. And, um, one time, I don't know what, remember what was going on, but we decided a number of us would go out and shoot pool. And it wasn't even like a real big drinking thing. It was like, we just met for like an hour, shot some pool. We each had like a beer, maybe two. Um, and then I remember I, I left real, real early. And I think Lonnie left too. And the next day he showed up to work and he's like, oh my gosh. And keep in mind, he had an amazing girlfriend. Like I, I, I really, I was jealous of him. Like he had an amazing girlfriend. She was talented, gifted, all that kind of fun stuff. And he's like, oh yeah, he goes, I blacked out after, uh, after, after we were together and I called her up and I, I called Lori up and said some awful things to her. And I don't, I didn't know about it until the next day. Cause that then she told me, but I didn't remember it at all. So he blacked out and did all that kind of stuff. And I go, Lonnie, I was there with you. You had one beer <laughs> and he's like, I, I don't even remember. So Lonnie was so sensitive to alcohol that one beer he blacked out and said awful things to a person that he actually cared about and loved and and regretted it so uh fortunately i didn't hear any of that kind of stuff going on uh, with anybody but what it comes down to is that uh alcohol does uh affect us in different ways and most importantly, with somewhat predictable results, right? Like when you, when you drink, you're not surprised if you get sick because you know it's gonna work that way. And, and uh, you know, other people is like, well, I get chill or I don't have the reservations that I might have, you know, that they're not, they're not as important to me and, uh, and things like that. So pretty much everybody seemed to have a good handle on what the effect of the alcohol would be. There might be a, a variation, like it might make you cry or it might make you laugh. I mean, either one, right? Yeah, I think that's a topic, like, that I tell my people too. Like, I can usually tell, like, like, people drinking a couple minutes from, but, like, I stopped the people on the phone. Like, I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. Like, I think it's, like, hard. It's, like, I drink too much of the water, so. <laughs> I, I think the first time that I, the, really the first time that I drank, I was 18 at, um, and I grew up in a home where there really wasn't any alcohol. My, 
then my parents got divorced, but I didn't live with my dad and he did drink. But I went to my, my dad's side of the family for Christmas Eve and my older cousin, Steve, decided he would mix the drinks for me. And I didn't know enough that that was a really bad idea. And so I was 18 years old and I remember having beer. I had a wine cooler um, and I had Seagram 7 uh, in like multiple drinks as well. And uh, I think I cried. I think I cried a lot after, after that night because uh, my body wasn't prepared. Well, what are some other drugs that we tend to use uh, that have predictable results for us? And these don't have to be like bad drugs necessarily, the, just any kind of drugs. What, what kind of drugs do we tend to use that have predictable results? Anti-inflammatories. I mean, <laughs> anti-inflammatories. Okay. Listen, I was about to say marijuana, but anti-inflammatories too. We need that. Yep. In fact, in in the uh, in our video, in our documentary, there is there's a guy that uh, I can't remember what he has. If he has Parkinson's, but he has some kind of a neurological disease, uh, and you know he can take 18 different medications that have side effects, or he can you know, he can smoke a joint and all of a sudden, you know, he can, he doesn't have to use all of his energy just to, to stay still for five minutes, you know. So anti-inflammatories, what are some other drugs that we use with predictable results? Jalen, what's that? How does, how does caffeine affect people? Okay, so some people tired, some people it gives energy. Okay, how many people drink coffee to try to help you wake up in the morning? No, but you do drink coffee it's for fun. Okay. That's a lot. Oh my. From caffeine. Yeah, ER think. for caffeine. Oh my goodness. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I took in college, I took a five hour energy and uh, it annihilated me. So I, 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 I kind of tried to avoid them after that. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, the first semester I taught this class, keep in mind, I didn't know anything about like the terms, the terminology, the ethicists. I didn't know anything about them. It's just like they, they asked me to teach Bible courses. Then they kept taking those away. And then they're like, oh, well, now we'd like you to teach ethics. And I'm like, well, of course I will. I just need the resources. But I had to educate myself, which means that I had to just spend hours and hours doing research and reading and preparation for the class that I was supposed to teach. And uh, there was th that semester, I would just like get a pot of coffee and just drink like the entire pot of coffee. And there were several times that um, I got wired, like severely wired by caffeine. It was, it was terrible. It was very uncomfortable. I did not enjoy it at all. Because <laughs> on one hand, I felt exhausted, but my body was like, wired. It was a very bizarre feeling. What are some other drugs, Braden? What's that? Oh, hallucinogenics. Yep. Okay. Anthony? Opioids? Yep. 
Yep, my son had uh, his wisdom teeth taken out uh, Thursday, last Thursday. And I got him home and they had given him a uh, Vicodin hydrocodone and he used it. So he had, what's that? I had my wisdom teeth before, taken out before I was taking out. And the teeth are freaked out while they're on the bakery. He wouldn't let me have any type of drugs. So when I was having wisdom teeth taken off, um, it was painful. Um, so, and I was also like high off the lack of death. So I think I did take a video of myself calling my mom. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I took, I took a video of myself calling my mom because she wouldn't give me the good stuff. I did the drugs. Oh my. And it didn't go away. Oh my. Yeah. So, it was pretty good. It was pretty good. Yeah, that's what she, that's what she tried. I wasn't, it wasn't as bad. I got really lucky when I got it. Yeah, I just felt it whenever they were taking out the back bottom. Shelby, what did you have to say? Sure. Oh, I can't wait to know. They gave me this medicine called Percocet. Percocet? Yeah. They didn't have, like, when they were little, the effects on it, and it made me, like, so light. I really think it was like, and it made me, like, feel, like, so, so exciting. And so we ended up calling the doctor and asking them, like, what's wrong with me? And they were, like, how much is that? And I was, like, did you just want to call me that? I was, like, so sick. I didn't go to school for, like, two months. Because of it. And so. Two like, months? Yeah, I missed. I got my finger in the table and I didn't go back to school. Oh my. And so from now on, I just took it and took it. I didn't take anything. I just didn't take anything. Sure. Because it was such a bad effect on me. It made me so small. And like, taking it so much. Sometimes when they do tell you what the side effects are, your body doesn't always uh, do the same thing. Like, um, what's what's that what's that decongestant that has that they put in meth amphetamines it, it's a really good decongestant Sudafed yeah Sudafed like what 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 I have a my buddy I have a buddy that's a doc I have a buddy that's a doctor and he told me I needed to take Sudafed for as a decongestant and he goes be careful though don't don't do any driving because it, it, it'll probably make you really tired so I started taking Sudafed and for three days, I didn't sleep. And so finally I called him. I said, what the heck is going on? You said that Sudafed would make me super tired. I haven't slept for three days. He goes, oh yeah, it can do that to you too. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I wish I would have known. Jalen? I was looking at and um, I was like, I really want to take it. And then I was So the about the morphine or the Percocet? The morphine. Oh, okay. I have something. Okay, Allie. Okay. So we were talking about wisdom teeth, right? Yep. Um, I used hydrocodone and I felt it, but if the class wants to see a bad reaction to a wisdom teeth surgery, I have this picture of me if you want to come look. <laughs> This is what happens with hydrocodone. Are you are you showing it to us? Oh yeah! If you want to come up and look, this was me in December of 2018. Oh my! Yeah, no filter. Oh goodness! Yeah, that's what hydrocodone. I mean, hydrocodone helped a lot. I was just really woozy and stuff, but yeah. Very woozy. Girl had some puffy cheeks for two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah. 
Yeah, Allie, we should have gotten you two ice packs and just like taped them to your face. Oh, I had them on my face oh. a lot. It was just very oh. painful. Webb? Um, I have had lots of but they were in I would take the, uh, had knee surgery. I was like, I was in high school. I, I was still playing football after my surgery. You know, I wasn't like that. Uh, well, uh, so I would, I would take them like during the games and stuff. And I, I get to still play football games. Even with hydrocodone? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And then, like, I, I've taken, I've taken a lot of uh, painkillers, but, uh, they don't have a lot of effect on you. No, I don't know if it's just like uh, I have like an addiction or something. Maybe I need to take more, but uh, I don't really like things going on around my sores and nothing else. Yeah, if they don't really work, then there's not a big incentive to keep taking them, right? right. Yeah. Well, those of you that are in the medical field, um, you might be interested to know this really doesn't have much to do with the class, but. My son um, had his wisdom teeth taken out. It was just his bottom two. And uh, he's 23. And so I got him, I, he had the surgery done in Galesburg where there was an oral surgeon there. And so I got him home to Quincy, which is about a two hour drive. And he was okay for about two, two hours, maybe two and a half hours. And then, um, and then he was standing at the sink and he called for me and uh, he was just spitting up blood like an enormous amount of blood. And so then he said, well, my head's, I'm getting lightheaded. So I just wrapped my arm around him right in front of the, the uh, sink. And he's just, I mean, the blood is just coming out. I can't believe how much blood's coming out of his face. And so then he passes out and his eyes roll up in his head. So I'm like holding on to him and I'm telling him to wake up. So he wakes up and I'm still holding him. And then he passes out again. So I'm calling 911 and they take him to the ER and the ER can't figure out how to get the blood stopped. And the blood's just, he actually lost over two liters of blood. And uh, the doctors in the ER were calling people in because they'd never seen anybody that lost so much blood from wisdom tooth extraction. And uh, there was no oral surgeon on call or anything like that. So they called in an ENT. If anybody knows Dr. Myron Jones, the ENT, he, uh, he, uh, he did pack some stuff in Wesley's uh, mouth and it actually stopped. It, I can't say it stopped the bleeding because he was still just, it was pretty much just gushing out, uh, but it did help. And then he called uh, an oral surgeon named Aaron Sheffield. I don't know if anybody knows Aaron Sheffield uh, from Quincy, but uh, she used a little stuff called Avatine, which is, it looks like it comes, it's about the size of like, if you've got like a little, uh, you know, honey mustard for your chicken nuggets. And that little thing cost a thousand dollars, but the oral surgeon, uh, Aaron Sheffield, she packed it in there and then she re-sutured it because he had uh, ruptured an artery in his mouth. And that's why they couldn't get the blood stopped. So, um, so, and everybody kept saying like, I've never seen this from a wisdom tooth before, <laughs> you know? So, I know, um, I know. I'm glad you mentioned honey mustard. Yes. And, uh, well, I have a little honey mustard issue. People say I have a problem. People say I have a problem. It's only a problem when I run out. It's only. What? Oh my goodness. Yeah. It's only a problem when I run out. I, I haven't run out of hon honey mustard since I was 15. Oh my goodness. You like it better than ranch? Is that a serious question? Oh my gosh. Like I, I'm just, I, I, I will say I am a big fan of mustard. I am a big fan of mustard. I, I mean, honey mustard, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm good. With, for you. I, I I'm know good. a lot of stuff about honey mustard that I probably shouldn't know. Uh oh. Closest I've come to that is 22. Oh my. In one city. Oh my. 
All right, well, I want to go over the actual definition of drugs in the book, and I do believe that our conversation will understand this definition because I think that we can agree that this is how it affects us. But the technical definition, according to the boss book, uh, defines drugs as chemicals that enter the bloodstream and are easily transported to the brain, where they alter the way we feel with predictable results. So I'll say it again. The drugs are defined as the chemicals that enter the bloodstream and are easily transported to the brain, where they alter the way we feel with predictable results. Alcohol, by this definition, is a type of drug. Drugs can be smoked, injected, snorted, or swallowed. Uh, I also want to go back just just briefly touch on the history of what, uh, what, what went on with alcohol and particularly what the relationship of the United States was with alcohol. Um, now, even before my time, uh, way before my time, there was uh, this thing that went on called the prohibition movement in the United States in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, in 1919, we had the 18th Amendment uh, we, uh, of the Constitution that made the distillation, the distribution, and the consumption of alcohol illegal. So that was 1919, the 18th Amendment. Can you imagine that? Illegal, it was. What actually happened was is that uh, People knew, the people that made the decision to add the 18th Amendment to prohibit alcohol, they knew that it wouldn't necessarily be a popular decision, but they never, ever considered the idea that the, the residents of the United States would actually disobey a rule like this. Now, as you know, uh, people did disobey prohibition there was a lot of illegal distribution, creation of alcohol. Uh, it provided an entire wave of black market for alcohol. And some say that there were more speakeasies and saloons in major cities with prohibition than there was even before the prohibition. Jalen? Oh my. Yep. Yeah. People like Al Capone and other gangsters uh, created a black market. And what happened uh, was that the cost of enforcing the prohibition was very, very dangerous because there was so much money in the black market that these business people like Al Capone and other gangsters, uh, they had lots of money to buy like machine guns and to buy, you know, to pay for people to fight on behalf of them to make sure that their illegal businesses continued. In fact, uh, the cost of enforcing prohibition was so damaging and it cost so much that in 1933, so just 34 years later, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, I, no, no, not 34, um, I guess that's 14 years later. 14 years later, they repealed prohibition with the 21st Amendment, um, and then alcohol was not illegal. Now, we do have some dry counties. We have some places that you can't buy stuff. There might be, there might be city rules like, oh, you can't buy alcohol on Sunday until noon or one o'clock or things like that. Um, I was actually surprised when I moved to Kentucky uh, about an hour from Lexington, Kentucky, and I lived in a little county called Bath County, and it was a dry county, so you couldn't actually buy any alcohol in that in that county now it wasn't illegal to buy it somewhere else and bring it in you just simply couldn't buy it um, i also a couple of years ago i was in uh, i was in a little town 
I can't remember the name of maybe liqueur or something like that. It, it was real close to peak in Illinois as a real small town. And technically that town had, a, it was considered a dry town. And so you had to drive like, you know, five minutes out of your way. And it seemed like you're in the same town, but technically you weren't. So you could get alcohol there. So those types of things still do exist. So what kind of, uh, I believe that part of the reason that you know, alcohol was made uh, illegal, that prohibition was enforced in 1919 was because of the Puritan understanding that, you know, it's sinful or wrong or damaging uh, to drink alcohol. So what kind of an ethical, if that was why it was made because of these uh, very conservative Christian traditions, uh, what kind of uh, ethical framework would have been used to, uh, to make a law that prohibited alcohol? What kind of ethical framework could they have been working from or most, most likely would have been working from? Braden? What's that? Utilitarianism. Utilitarianism. And how would that have applied? So by saying don't drink alcohol, ultimately, you know, they would hope to diminish the negative effects of alcohol and thus help help a lot of people, right? Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. Anthony, what were you going to say? And how would that have applied? Uh, just to not like overindulge, I guess. Like being, um, not, I don't know, just like don't consume stuff that's going to be bad. But it, but it would, it would include uh, the idea that God doesn't want you to drink, right? Okay, so it could be divine command. Three, okay, Jalen. If God didn't want you to drink, why would Jesus turn water into wine? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it could have been hard seltzer, right? <laughs> Jesus hard lemonade. No. Oh, well. Bad joke. <laughs> sure. Social contract theory? So they're giving up personal liberties to do what? Okay. 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 So you're saying that when people drink, it does affect more people than just themselves. Yeah. Absolutely. That that is <laughs> that's actually true. Most of us have had family members, or maybe we've struggled, you know, with alcohol abuse, or you know, we've had people that we've come in contact with, or maybe even struggle with it ourselves and it, it does affect those around us right yeah who am i missing what uh, any other ethical frameworks that if you were gonna make pro you know if you were gonna argue for prohibition of alcohol any other Say, say that a little bit louder, Jasmine. And how would ethical egoism apply? Right. Okay. 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 Care ethics. Yeah. 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 I. I mean. Even though alcohol is a very common drug that's used and 
a lot of people do use it in responsible ways. It can be used in irresponsible ways, right? And uh, even when you're using it in irresponsible or in responsible ways, sometimes it doesn't always make your life 100% better, right? Like sometimes there's a price that you'll have to pay even, even if it doesn't ruin your life. Like it, it might make you throw up or it might make you just feel bad the next day or, you know, it doesn't have to. I'm just saying it could though, right? So care ethics, you know, you could, you could make an argument for that. Anthony? Uh, I just read an interesting article, maybe all like two weeks ago or three weeks ago, uh, that like the women's suffrage movement back to prohibition to an extent. Yep. To where, uh, where uh, like wives at home were concerned because their husbands after getting off work would go. Oh, and yeah. This and, this, and there were like, you know, cases of like bar fights and stuff like that. So right. I think, I don't know, I, I don't know if like you had heard about any of that. Like yeah. Women's suffrage was advanced. With yep. Prohibition. There were there were there were definitely some of those things going on. Yep. Right. And uh, with with uh, categorical imperative that Immanuel Kant uh, promoted, uh, you know, you're not supposed to use anyone as a means to an end. Right. Uh, what do you do with alcohol? You're using your own body as a means to an end. Right. I mean, if you're drinking for effect, if you're drinking for a buzz, or if you're drinking to, to be more relaxed or something like that, you could make that argument. So with categorical imperative, you know, you, you could also argue that prohibition could be used uh, for that. But, um, okay, so after prohibition, uh, we've got all these gangsters, basically a lot of, a lot of police force, a lot of people that are in charge of enforcing prohibition are losing their lives. They're not having a very, very much luck actually enforcing prohibition. It's causing a lot of damage. Instead of the government making money, criminals are making the money, right? Instead of getting taxes off of that kind of stuff. So say you're, say you're the leaders of the United States and you're, and you're sitting around making a decision. Um, you see all these deaths, you see no decrease in the use of alcohol and uh, you're seeing that it's impossible. You're spending millions of dollars in the early 1900s trying to enforce prohibition with almost no good results. Why would you, what ethical framework would you use to argue that we should repeal prohibition and legalize alcohol once again? You guys are good. Hold that thought. Let's see if we can get some other folks, okay? Peyton? As, as a leader, would you, would you uh, say that we should legalize it because of pleasure? Um, or would that be more like what individuals would probably... I feel like that's more of what individuals... That's okay. I would, I yeah. I would say hedonism is one reason that we drink. You know, we, we want pleasure. You know, we, we are creatures that gravitate towards that. So, Webb? Okay. And why would libertarianism be an ethical framework that would help you make that decision that we should? legalize it for people to make their own decision um because uh libertarianism believes that a person has the right to make free will for moral responsibility so if they think it's morally impossible for them to drink then they should be able to make that decision and if they think it's not then they have right to make the decision very good that if we don't have those decisions to those choices to make like we have to be able to make have those choices right that's right that's right would there be any any okay so you're these leaders you're seeing all this bad stuff happening with the prohibition and you're like i think maybe we should make it legalized again are there any other ethical frameworks that you might use Okay. More. 
How about you, Allie? What, what ethical framework would you use to make that decision? I would use ethical egoism because at the end of the day, it is a person's choice for what they want to do with their body when it comes to drugs and alcohol for their own self-interest. So that's what I use in my paper. And I just think you have to do what's best for you. And if you go too far and pay the consequences, it was your choice. So that's why you drink responsibly, in my opinion. Okay. Very good. That makes sense. Ethical egoism. How uh, would anybody use utilitarianism to make that decision? Say that again, Brayden. Right. If it's not alcohol killing people, now it's the mafia with machine guns, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I think that you could definitely use ethical or I mean, uh, utilitarianism to, you know, create a safer environment um, that the cost of enforcing prohibition was just too extreme. And they were surprised about that. All right, they do cover this in the documentary, uh, but uh, and this was shocking to me when I first engaged in this class. Uh, but when we talk about the negative effects of different types of drugs, uh, it's important for you to know that when we talk about tobacco, that it kills 5 million people every year worldwide. 5 million people. That's tobacco, uh, and they they add in addictive substances to it, so that makes it even more difficult for people to kick. And then for alcohol, it kills five hundred thousand people per year. So tobacco is five million a year, alcohol is five hundred thousand a year. Um, how many people do you think die every year from marijuana and cannabis use. What's that? Yep, it's zero. I did have somebody in my in my last semester's class that claimed that there was some claim that somebody died, but I don't have any I don't have any proof of that. And in our documentary, uh, it actually does say that zero. The boss book says it's zero. So I, even if you can find someone um, Cannabis use uh, certainly doesn't seem to be something that kills a lot of people. And I think people have been using it long enough that if it was going to kill somebody uh, that we would know by now. So um, I do think that it's interesting that tobacco uh, has been legal and alcohol has primarily been legal, but cannabis use uh, has not been legal until just recently for the most part. They do cover that in the documentary too. Uh, much of that was centered around uh, Richard Nixon's uh, presidency and concern that he uh, was not going to appeal to people of color. And so there was the desire uh, to have, there, there was just blatantly racist overtones uh, that they promoted that uh, people of color were, you know, basically the only people that used uh, marijuana, and then a lot of people got thrown in jail and ended up getting thrown in jail for many, many decades over that. So, uh, in fact, at one point, I don't know if it's still true or not, since a lot of cannabis has been legalized, two thirds of the people that were in j in prison and jail for uh, drug-related offenses, two-thirds were in for marijuana. That's an awful lot. That's an awful lot, especially when you consider that marijuana has never killed anybody. I don't know if you can argue that it's never hurt anybody, but it's never killed anybody. And so to have, to have people in jail for multiple years where it's on their record, and if you've ever dealt with that, is once you get in jail 
and that's on your record. Every time you apply for a job, you know what it asks? Have you ever been convicted of anything? And so it will follow you around wherever you go. So once somebody gets put in jail, it's very, very hard for them to get a good job following that up because then they have to explain and it looks bad to a potential employer. Uh, when, we, when we take a look at more about what the boss book says, uh, it says that the use of illicit drugs by youth peaked in 1981 when 66% of American youth under the age of 18 tried illegal drugs. Uh, I will also tell you that my stepsister turned 18 uh, or turned 18 about two months after they changed the legal drinking age from 18 to 21. And she was very angry about that. Um, do you think that the laws, do you think that the, the drinking laws, like the age laws, do you think they are followed very, very well? No. Do you think they do any good? They just make, they what? They should change it back. Say that again, Jalen. I did always think it was very hypocritical of our nation that we can draft an 18 year old, but then they have to wait until they're 21 to make an adult decision to drink any alcohol. I, I just thought that was inappropriate. <laughs> Yep, you're an adult in every aspect except for that. Yeah. They what? Oh yeah, you can get sent to adult prison. You can get charged like an adult, all that kind of fun stuff, right? Yep, I, I think that people have legitimate gripes on that. In a September 1999 Gallup poll, 36% of Americans responded that drinking has been a cause of trouble in their families, up from 14% in 1950 and 23% in 1990. Um, I know that alcohol has been a problem in multiple ways in my family. How many of you would say that alcohol has contributed to your family in a negative way in some, some way? I'm raising well, my hand. Allie's raising, you're raising your hand too? Okay, so that's way over 50%. So I think that uh, I think the idea of 36% is probably a low one. I'm just guessing. I don't know about these statistics. It said in the book that American undergraduates drink 4 billion cans of beer a year and spend an average of 466, $446 on alcoholic beverages, which I think that amount is probably a lot more in 2021. A 1994 survey of 140 campuses in the United States revealed that 51% of college students are heavy drinkers. So that was a 1994 survey of 140 campuses in the United States revealed that 51% of college students are heavy drinkers and 44% of them are con considered binge drinkers and binge drinking I think this is actually on the test as well. Where are the where are the stats about binge drinking? Four drinks for a girl and five drinks for a guy. Okay. 15 a week and 10 a week. I've never heard the weekly statistics. Okay, very interesting. Thank you for sharing. All right. Um, in addition to such problems as poor concentration, lower GPA, and health risks, binge drinking among college students is linked to intentional violence. 
including assault, homicide, rape, brawls, vandalism, and burglary, as well as being the victim of aggression, in part because if you're intoxicated, it makes the person an easier target for a predator. And half of all date rapes are associated with alcohol consumption. There's basically two sides of the coin when it comes to alcohol addiction. Uh, back when I was growing up, uh, the first George Bush's wife had a, uh, a, a campaign called Just Say No, and they promoted it all in schools. And it was the idea that, uh, that addiction, you know, that alcohol addiction was just a personal decision in which you just had to say no, and then you could stop drinking. And then you had the AA model that says, well, alcohol addiction is a disease. And you can probably, you know, very few people actually uh, get rid of their disease, but, you know, with help and support, you can get it under control and you can manage it, but that you're always, uh, you know, you always have the disease. Now, so that's two sides of the coin. One is it's just a personal decision. The other one is, is that you can't ever not be an alcoholic or you can never not have a drinking problem if you do. And usually people fall somewhere in between that there is an element where there is a personal decision that if you do want to drink or you don't want to drink. But I think we also see that some people have a, that alcohol does have a pull in their life where just a personal decision not to drink, they might need more help than that, right? So usually people don't fall either on one side of it or the other. Usually they're somewhere in between where, yes, there is, a, there is a personal decision, but sometimes for some people it requires more than just a personal decision. You might need some actual help, counseling, support group, things like that to deal with that. Okay. Well, people always have a choice to get help too, you know. That is true too. True. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm not saying, I, I'm not saying it in a judgmental way, but I mean, you know, I see a lot of people that have drug and alcohol addictions and they think that nobody can help them and they think that they can do it themselves and they don't ever reach out and get, get that. They don't even try to get that help. You know what I mean? Sure. 
I, I think, you know, I think most people that are in the jaws of addiction, they do want help. It's just not clear how to, how to actually get it. Sure. Well, a lot of times it is really hard for people because, um, you know, there are people that have gone through abuse and they carry baggage with them that's really, really, they don't know how to deal with. And, uh, you know, it, it becomes a, a way that people deal with bad memories, with bad experiences, with failures, all kinds of things. And sometimes that stuff's really, really hard to get over. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna discount it that it's not difficult. My mom did a rehab the last time that she died. They made her like keep this notebook and journal and things. And then she had like certain things she had to write about and like certain things she had to do. And that's how I like found out a lot about my mom's addiction. And she was always about that journal once I got with her. Um, but one of the things I made her do was like write a letter to my little sister and I. And she didn't have anything written to my little sister. And the only thing she could bring herself to write in mind was. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. And sometimes you just end up in the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's let's uh, touch on what some of the ethicists uh, wrote. You know, their positions on drug and alcohol use. Uh, many religious traditions, like Buddhism, Islam, and some branches of Christianity, oppose the use of drugs. Uh, if you grew up in a in an Episcopalian church, they'll use uh, or a Catholic church, they'll use wine for communion. Um, I was shocked about this because I grew up in an Assembly of God church, which was very anti-alcohol. Like it was like, well, if you're a Christian, you don't drink alcohol. And so when we had communion, it was grape juice. And then one time, I when I got into college at Western Illinois University. I thought I would go to a Presbyterian church and I didn't know really where it was. And then somehow I didn't pay very close attention. And I walked into an Episcopalian church and they had communion. And so I went up and, and, and took communion and I could tell that it was, it was wine. And uh, I couldn't have been more surprised uh, because I, I didn't know where I was. I also didn't know much about Episcopalians either. So. Yeah. Funny thing about the Bible, and I usually get into this in the class, but our class on sexuality and marriage, I didn't have time to go through uh, what the Bible actually says about sex and marriage, but I, I did email out the PowerPoint for the workshop that I did. I don't know if you got a chance to look at it, but 
if you do go through it, it, it does a very good job of articulating that the Bible literally says more than one thing about everything. So whoever says, I only believe what the Bible says, my question is, which part? Can you, can you believe opposite things on the same issue? Because that's what you get with the Bible. Because the Bible was actually written by lots of different people over a long period of time. And the context also matters. And sometimes, how many people have ever made a decision about something and then 10 years, well, you're not very old. A few years later, you realize that you were wrong, right? I have. Does that mean that you double down and you're like, no. I'm just going to double down and this is the way it is. This is the way it has to be. No, the normal thing for us as humans is, oh, I made a mistake. I loaned money to that guy, <laughs> you know, or I made this decision about alcohol or I made this decision about family and then it didn't work out. What do we do? We make adjustments, right? We say, oh, that was a mistake. I wish I had done it differently. And then hopefully we are able to do it differently. All the Bible is, is sometimes it's one of those things where we think we're making the best decision. You know, like maybe the part, you know, what I would say, this is just my personal opinion. This isn't on the test and you don't have to believe this. But, you know, what I say is the, the clobber passage, passages that, uh, that, that make homosexuality look like a sin or wrong. Um, that was where we got it wrong. That's where we were doing our best to make, to, to do what we thought was right. But the longer we lived and experienced, and especially when we became an industrialized nation where we used logic and reason, we look back at that and go, ah, we were doing the best that we can. Instead of demonizing those passages, why don't we just learn from them and say, we're doing our best. We're trying to be faithful. But now we look at those and realize that there's other passages that affirm the worth and the value of all people, including people that are gay or transgender, LBTQ. Yeah. Sure. I am an ordained minister. I have a Master of Divinity that took me three years to get. So. Well, I, I really stuck in the word, but I just put it specifically in the role it was. There's a passage in the Bible that's ordained Exodus 21 10. And I'll never forget this. I'm like for this passage or anything like that. Uh, my religion teacher started to tell me that the uh, Bible uh, talks about purity and like says that it's okay. I just wanted to, I just wanted to see if you thought that that was true. Well, um, I mean, that one's hard to argue against because uh, not only is does the Old Testament promote polygamy, but how many people, when you go to your family reunion, uh, you get out your Tinder uh, to see if anybody's there? Yes. Sounds crazy. But in the Old Testament, you were not supposed to marry outside of your family. You were not supposed to marry outside of your family. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, read, read Genesis. Yes. Yes, that is. Yeah, so. So, Ab so Abraham. Abraham had. Abraham. I mean, all of the patriarchs had lots of wives. And not just wives, but also concubines on top of that. You know, Solomon was, you know, he was a king that had many wives. And uh, in Genesis, which is one of the most important books in the Bible, uh, one of the patriarchs, when he was young, uh, Jacob, uh, he was kind of a scoundrel, and he, uh, he fooled his dad. He, he kind of fooled his brother, fooled his dad. He was very deceptive, and when he found out, he was scared that he was going to get his butt kicked, and so he, he told his mom, I got to get out of here, and so you know where you know where he decided to go? He decided to go to his uncle Laban's. And his mom was thrilled because she didn't want him marrying someone outside of the Jewish uh, or the, the Hebrew uh, group 
And more specifically, she wanted him to marry one of his cousins, Uncle Laban's daughters. So he not only married one, he married both of them. So if you, how many people really want to know what the Bible says about sex and marriage? Do you really want to date and marry your relatives? Do you really want to have multiple spouses? Because these people that say, I only believe, I only live what the Bible says about sex and marriage. Do you really think that that's really what ought to be done? Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, and then there's, there's, if you read through the, the, the thing that I, the PowerPoint that I sent out to you, there's also other scriptures that are, uh, I, I don't want, I don't, I don't want my family to be, or any women that I care about to be influenced by this, but you know, there's some scriptures in Deuteronomy that say, oh, if you're a man and you think that your wife cheated on you, you take them to the priest, the priest will give your wife poison and, and it will drop her uterus and kill her, but only if she's, only if she's uh, guilty. So, so. Just remember that, that a lot of these things, including the Bible, were put together in a pre-industrialized nation. That means logic and reason didn't always, it wasn't the way that we embrace it in the Western world. You know, like there's another story in the Bible where Jacob, when he's, he's working, he's, he's actually working so he can marry his cousins. And uh, so he works 14 years total so that he can marry his two cousins, seven years each. And then uh, he, he tends the farm uh, where the sheep are. He makes a deal. He's so successful in taking care of his uncle Laban's sheep that he wants to reward him. And Jacob barters with him so that like, oh, any of the sheep that are striped, Jacob would get. Or any of the sheep that are spotted, Jacob would get. So according to the scripture, um, it says that he put sticks down that had spots on them where the, where the sheep ate. And so when they ate, they bred, they bred, and then they got spots because they looked at sticks with spots. And then the other one was, is that he put sticks with stripes on them. So they looked at those while they ate. And then when they bred, they bred with stripes. Now, how many people think that what color, uh, uh, you know, dots and stripes on a stick actually have anything to do with if sheep breed? No, no. You know, but that was a pre-industrialized world. And so we have to use a critical eye when we talk about the Bible. And I do believe that the Bible is important and it's powerful. I believe that it does guide and direct us and I don't want to discriminate against it, but I also don't want us to misuse it. And I think that using it to learn where we got it wrong, realize that the Bible says more than one thing uh, about every single thing and that we do use logic and reason, I think that, uh, I don't know, I mean, the reason I brought it up was that when it comes to the Bible, I don't think it was ever intended to micromanage our sex lives, 
And I don't think it's actually healthy for it to micromanage our sex lives. And when people tell you that they have the biblical view of marriage and sexuality from the Bible, and it and it's this it's this puritanical view that you shouldn't have sex before marriage and that it's only between one man and one woman, that's actually not what the Bible says. So now that might be, there's nothing wrong with that view. Uh, there's nothing sinful about that or wrong, and it might be the best path for multiple people. But if you talk about what the Bible actually says about sex and marriage, it's a bit disturbing. And I don't think that we can ignore those things and pretend like the Bible only says one thing about these things. So when it comes to drugs or alcohol or whether it comes to polygamy, I think that we, have, we need to have a bigger view of what the Bible says and that if it's authoritative in our lives, then we need to use logic and reason and understand what the totality of the Bible says and not just pick and choose those and say, well, that's it and there's nothing else because the Bible is actually a giant book and it says a lot of things, so. All right, any questions about that? Because I kind of dumped a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't have anything to do about drugs and alcohol on here, so. And you might think I'm crazy, that's all right too. I've, I've, had, lots of, I've had lots of anonymous letters, some of them not anonymous, but I've had a lot of anonymous letters that told me how, how wrong I was, so. <laughs> Well, I, part of the reason I bring it up is just that uh, most time I don't hear pastors say these kinds of things to people. And so that means that people are a lot of times they think that Christianity is only what you heard, like when you were in second grade uh, from people that only have one perspective about the Bible or God. And I just think that religion and I think that our relationship with God and I think the Bible is too important for us to diminish it to let it be narrowed down to that. I mean, I, I remember, I will never forget, my son is a, he's a very good critical thinker. He's highly intelligent. And we went to a church where we had the wrong people teaching second grade Sunday school. And I will never forget him running out of class because they had told him that absolutely Noah's Ark had one of or two of every kind of animal on the ark. And he had all kinds of questions about them eating each other and things like that. And they made up some crazy thing about it and told him that he was wrong. And he just wasn't having it. Even in second grade, he wasn't having it. And uh, so I, I just think it's important that people know there's other trains of thought and there's other ways to approach the Bible and just because you look at it critically, and even though you look at it and say, I don't agree with this, and you have a logical reason why, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I've actually preached against some passages and said, no, this is what we thought, but we need to do, we need, this is, there's other passages of the Bible that give us direction, and, uh, and we, sh we should pay attention to those too. So, I don't know, you might think I'm crazy, but. That's all right. All right, let me go through quickly uh, about some of the Ephesus. John Stuart Mill uh, reflects a libertarian attitude towards drug use. He believes the individual ought to decide. And in his utilitarian calculus, he concludes, quote, the benefits of liberty, in other words, outweighs the harms caused by alcohol and drug use, unquote. So, uh, so basically he is saying that yes, even though alcohol can do some damage, the uh, pro prohibiting it causes more damage than if we actually uh, pro you know, allow it. Uh, virtue uh, in most cases requires, okay, I'm not gonna go over that. Immanuel Kant and the categorical imperative states that we should never use ourselves as a means only Immanuel Kant says, I think this is on the exam too, Kant says that addicts debase themselves by using themselves as a means only. So the idea that people drink to get high, they drink to forget, they drink for whatever reason it is, but they shouldn't use themselves as a means only. Uh, John Locke, a natural rights ethicist, uh, said that because those who desire to quit often cannot, 
Addiction is a form of slavery. I, I think we've kind of dealt with that a little bit in this class, that addiction can be a form of slavery. It can be very difficult to get out of and challenging for people. And so he says that uh, we should not use our liberty rights uh, to sell ourselves into slavery. So that's what John Locke says, is that we should not use our liberty rights to sell ourselves into slavery of addiction. Uh, using this analogy, analogy, it is also wrong to turn our lives over to drugs. The ethical egoist and the utilitarian are both interested in maximizing pleasure. So questions about drug use are often framed in these terms. All right. We've kind of already dealt with uh, some of the effects of alcohol. We've dealt with the effect it has on those around us and things like that. Uh, there are statistics about uh, crimes in the, in the chapter. I'm not gonna go over those. But I don't know, any, any questions or comments about anything? All right, all right, it is 7.46. And we can watch about an hour. We can take a break and come back and watch. I really, we really need to watch about an hour of the documentary, but if you just wanna watch it on your own, and you want to do that, you can, because uh, I don't really have time before nine o'clock to actually have us watch the whole thing. Uh, but if you want to watch an hour, I, I think an hour will do it. You might watch like an hour and 10 minutes just to make sure, but you want to do that on your own time. It will be on, it will be on the test. Um, but if you do the response paper and you only watch an hour and 10 minutes of it, That'll be fine. Okay. If you want to watch the whole thing, you can too. That's fine too. All right, everybody. Have a great night. We'll see. Oh, you're saying that. Okay. <laughs> Love you. Miss you. Thank you. Love right, we'll everybody. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. Jay. Jay just Jay just little have a recovery. Still, he relapsed. There's nothing to recover from. He tried. He tried to, you know, ease up on it, but he relapsed. Oh man, I tried. I tried. Look, at least I went from using eight at a time to four at a time. There you go. And then four to two, and I'm um, back at four. Yeah, I feel like we almost weren't friends earlier. Thanks for joining us, Allie. Of course. Um, my spinal tap is Monday at seven thirty in the morning, so I don't know how I'll be feeling that night, but I will keep you updated. Okay. So. Well, I I'm plan I'm just gonna plan on recording these uh, sessions, so. Um, I don't want you to feel pressured in any way, shape, or form. I'm going to send out another link. I'm going to send out another link uh, for the documentary for that one. And uh, if you want, I can send it out to you anytime. Like if you want me to send it out like today or uh, probably not today, but I can I can send it out this week. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. That works for me. But uh, no, you're you're doing great. I don't. How are you? How are you? You seem to be doing so well. Uh, considering uh, you have some pretty significant health issues going on. How are you doing it? Um, I'm doing okay right now. I mean, I'm just trying to stay up with classes and stuff, but this is my fourth week home and yeah, I'm just doing my best with what's been thrown at me. Well, you're doing really, really good in this Thank class. You. I appreciate your attention to detail uh, and I'm proud of you. Thank you, Professor Hunt. I appreciate it. Oh. Hello. You bet. If there's anything I can do or you need, you just let me know. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. See ya. Bye.